let me point out that I'm going to sort of take a big step back from the what seems like a big issue, energy, but it's actually a derivative issue. And in my brief remarks, I want to focus on a kind of uh, macro picture of what we should expect to happen technologically in the coming decade, which has profound implications for the energy sector in every respect. You know, the shutdowns that we've all uh, lived through, the global of global economies in 2020, you've heard this, you know, it said that changed everything. Well, it, it did change everything, but it did accelerate a lot of trends that were already underway. And then, sorry, it also reinforced a kind of schizophrenia, I think, about our future. So, you know, on one hand, we have the dystopian view of jobs being eliminated by AI and robots. And on the other hand, we have these claims of disruptions, if you like, in the automotive electricity and banking industries. But these sort of two conflicting views are only partly right. And they miss a much bigger picture, I think, that's underway. So the narrative today, in effect, let me just put it simplistically, is focused on electric vehicles, EVs, as a kind of foundational revolution. That misses the point. Lithium batteries are consequential, but economic and social impact of electric cars is equivalent to analogously changing the nature and source of horse food before the age of the car. Of course, the source of the fuel does change the winners and losers in any industrial ecosystem, but going from liquid hydrocarbons to liquid chemistries and batteries is not like going from the horse and buggy to the car age. EVs are still cars. And similarly, changing the fuel used to make electricity, that's important, it's consequential, but it's not as profound as, or as impactful as the invention of electric power in the first place. But the advent of something like robots, for example, both virtual ones in the form of artificial intelligence and physical robots in warehouses and factories, that's a phenomenological change. That's equivalent to going from the horse to the car. And it's a change that's comparable in economic and structure, the structural revolution that began back in the 1920s, in fact. Economies don't go through these giant revolutions, phase changes, if you like, very often. It only happens a handful of times. These are the phase changes that, that impact not just some businesses, but all of an economy, and that can last for decades and for centuries. The last time the world saw a deep revolution or phase change in the global economy was a century ago. It wasn't the invention of uh, one thing or, or uh, uh, what, because of one big uh, person or inventor. So, you know, historians like to use the lens of one invention to sort of paint pictures. But what really happens is the simultaneous confluence of big changes in the three domains that determine everything about how we build and how we operate civilizations. These are perhaps illustrated here in this Venn diagram, the, the kinds of materials that we have access to and the kinds of machines we can build from those materials and with those materials. And of course, underlying it all, the third domain is the information we have about materials and machines and the means to store and communicate and share that information. A century ago, in 1920, roughly, we saw the maturation and acceleration of practical cars and power plants, alloys and polymers, synthetic materials in effect, and of course, telephony and the radio, and, and the beginning of the professionalization of science itself. What followed from that confluence was history's greatest expansion of wealth and well-being ever. And of course, I mean, let me state the obvious, humans also continue to fight wars and we put policies in place that cause recessions and depressions. But technology can perform magic. It can't fix human propensities for malfeasance and conflict. It can't fix stupidity, not to go off on that tangent. So today, roughly 2020, we're seeing in our time an identical confluence in big changes in these same three core domains. The materials revolution that's now underway is the maturation of profoundly new classes of how we can create materials, reaction materials that can react, that are dynamic, that are so quote smart. Uh, it's as big a change as the advent of the chemical industry. Similarly, we're seeing unprecedented emergence in the maturation of practical machines that exhibit autonomy, right? Self-awareness even. Machines that even have the ability to fabricate literally at atomic scales. And underlying all this, we've got this very recent, recent emergence, uh, which began barely a decade ago, of the global cloud. This is on track to become the biggest infrastructure that the humanity has ever built. The cloud democratizes information, not communications. It's democratizing the power of artificial intelligence. 
The latter, artificial intelligence, is really a general purpose technology, much in this way that a combustion engine was or the electric power plant was a century ago. In fact, it's, it's just really quite remarkable how quickly most people have taken for granted the build out of the world's biggest and newest infrastructure. It's one that constitutes the fastest growing, by the way, source of new electricity demand. For scale perspective, the heart of the cloud, of course, are the data centers, but these are giant buildings filled with silicon machines, not with people. Measured in square feet, enterprise class data centers are as big as the world's biggest skyscrapers. But each data center uses 100 times more power per and there are three times more data centers in the world today than there are giant skyscrapers. And the world is building more data centers at the rate of about $400 billion worth of them every year. It's an amazing build out. The cloud, the, here's the key thing. The, the, the key structural feature of the cloud is that it democratizes information, information processing at a rate far faster than anything we've ever seen in history. It's an amplifier of knowledge and informed action that will impact every corner of our economy, not just one. Critically, if we measure this in economic terms, the cloud has accelerated you know, far past the dizzying rate of change that we've all talked about with respect to computing power over the past uh, half century, you know, Moore's Law. The combination of this technology progress underway now and the economies of scale the cloud brings are reducing the cost of computation, not just its power, but the cost of accessing it by a thousand fold per decade. That's far faster than Moore's Law's revolution of the past half century. That's the critical feature of the cloud that's rapidly driving down the cost of what was formerly far too expensive for applications in every part of the economy, the you know, compute intensive forms of uh, artificial intelligence. Look, artificial intelligence has gotten a lot of press lately, but it's important to keep in mind that that revolution has unfolded so far mainly in information domains. The main impact of uh, computing and AI and in the cloud though, so far has been primarily in the parts of the economy that are essentially information, informational in nature themselves. That is the news, entertainment, banking, finance, trade, you know, travel arrangements. The information technology has in effect accelerated other information centric domains. But in the cloud era, and because of the transformation of new classes of materials and machines, we're now going to be see, begin to see for the first time the migration of digitalization and software and AI at scale into the rest of the economy, into the manufacturing and transportation sectors, into mining, and as some of you have talked about, into the energy sector. Collectively, that's the 80% of the economy, the, the atoms part of the economy, not the bits part of our economy. So. The, the core thing I, I want to close on is that the, the main impact of technology on our economy, the critical one is that it changes productivity. The emergence of IT at scales that we're now seeing will accelerate productivity and bring productivity growth back to goods and services. You know, productivity is by fundamentally the reduction in the quantity of materials and labor to produce the same output. That's the single most important feature of an economy. That's what accelerates growth. That's what creates wealth and well-being. And not irrelevantly, that's what makes it possible to afford the kinds of things we care about in the modern economy, things like uh, better quality of life, lower environmental impacts. Virtually every aspect of our economy now will be accelerated by these, this cloud revolution combined with the materials revolution and the ma machine revolution. It's going to cause what we could call a phase change. And we're seeing this in the news kind of daily, you constantly hear about, you know, robots and automation and AI, all of these things that we're, we're hearing about from air taxis to you know, personal robots and the not too distant future. These kinds of things, smart materials, consumable computers, literally computers that we can swallow that will make measurements about our body's conditions to help in healthcare. These kinds of things in combination are all emerging from this confluence of these three domains. It's a revolution. I'll restate it as big as we saw in the 1920s. In fact, I say it's bigger than we saw in the 1920s, you know, when we saw the three classes converge at that time. Let me just close by, you know, reading you the title of my new book, and I'm self-promoting my book here. I mean, this, this map that I just painted is actually the content of what I, I believe is really happening. It's the subject of, of my uh, forthcoming book that's out uh, in about a week. And I'll just end by telling what the title of the book is because it summarizes sort of my, my broad thesis, which I think we're 
all living about to live through. It's, you know, it's the cloud revolution. It's how the convergence of new technologies unleashes the next economic boom. And what I think we'll come to see in the future is a roaring uh, 2020s. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, I have so many questions now. I mean, uh, we don't have the time because we're already closing the stage, but uh, just this, this thing about quantum computing keeps popping in my head around the, the, the curve sure. and the slope sure. that's happening there. Uh, the other one is the sustainability of accessing the materials and, and how that's actually impacting sure. and, and the different theories, basically, that they are there. Anyway, it was an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much for being here for us and connecting uh, all the way from Maine. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And this big applause from our stage here. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.